Well, first of all, we are announcing that uh, late yesterday we filed suit in federal court against the current HISD evaluation uh, in which half of the evaluation for a good number of the teachers is a statistical measure that we consider very seriously flawed. Now, let me explain what I mean by that, and then we, we have Craig Dietz here who's going to explain the details of the lawsuit because I wouldn't even consider trying. Uh, but one of the things I want to say right up front is we expect to hear the district say, well, this system weeds out ineffective <coughs> teachers. So what we have here are four teachers who, by any standard the district has used other than this formula, are extremely effective, and you're going to hear their stories and how they have been damaged, and these are plaintiffs in the case. But we do want to explain what our problem is. We use a system called EVOS. It was developed by a man named Bill Sanders, and allegedly it can project whether a teacher has taught a child everything they need to know. Now, you have to consider that wasn't what the formula was first developed for. It was first developed to measure uh, the productivity in some bulls in the birth weight of the calves that they produced. Uh, Bill Sanders was an ag major. Bill Sanders also, when the district first started using this formula, it was just used for bonuses. I was at a meeting where we asked him, should your formula, will this ever be used for teacher evaluation? And he told us it would be totally inappropriate to use it for evaluation. I still agree with, with his early position. Now, what that says is, and first of all, Anyone in here that can tell me what they think that says, because this is how a teacher is judged as effective or ineffective. What they allegedly can do is take the past test scores a student has and based on that, plug it into this formula and it will project what they should score. Now, there's a certain absurdity in that that common sense should tell people, and that's it assumes that the only factor related to whether a child learns is the teacher. So if the child is living under the Pierce Elevated with his parents who are homeless, or if he's watched one of his parents beat the other one the night before, or if he's not eating regularly or he's not healthy, none of those factors count. The only factor that counts is the teacher, according to Evos. Now... One of the things we're alleging is there are considerable statistical problems with it. And it's not just us alleging. If you look at the lawsuit, it cites the American Statistical Association as basically saying it's not ready for prime time, Rand Corporation, and we put a study in your press packets done by Dr. Beardsley at Arizona State specifically done on HISD. Uh, along with the fact that we feel you can't isolate a teacher as the only factor, you can't explain this to a teacher and have them understand. I mean, we hear the board frequently say, oh, we don't understand why they don't get it. That's why they don't get it. It is doctoral level math, and I did have one, one time, who understood it. He had a PhD in math, and then he said, well, I need the computer algorithms because I can't figure my score without it. So we put in an open records request, and what we got back is, sorry, the contract with the company makes these proprietary. Even the district doesn't have them. So basically what happens is the test scores are plugged into a black box where no teacher can either calculate or try and refute the number that comes out that tells if they're a good teacher or an effective teacher, as HISD would say. And... This flawed measure is half of an evaluation. Now, that's, of course, half of the evaluation where some of them are actually using the state accountability tests, but we have grade levels that don't, where they rely on the Stanford Achievement Test. And on those, that test isn't aligned with our curriculum, 
So you're testing a child on something that he hasn't been taught because it's not part of the curriculum, and then you're determining whether the teacher was effective. Well, the only way that teacher is going to come up effective is if they teach the test rather than the state curriculum. I mean, there are multiple factors in here, but the, the primary factor is the teachers don't understand it. It's statistically not ready for prime time. And additionally, even if they do understand it, they can't get to the black box that it's sitting in because of the contract with the company that sold this to them. There are also specific groups of teachers where it doesn't work. Like we have a number of students who, in elementary, will take the test in Spanish the first couple of years, and then they shift to English. And what we see district-wide is when they shift to English, the whole class is scores 10. Uh, if you teach gifted and talented like Andy does, there's not much room for them to come up. Those kids are blowing the lid off the test. So it's very hard for him to get a growth factor, and God forbid a kid should miss a question because it could really damage his score. So that's, that's a serious problem. Plus, you can manipulate a teacher's scores by which students you give them and whether or not there's a growth potential. And, you know, we're, we're not anti-evaluation, but we expect a fair evaluation, and we have had enough time to look at this. It wasn't a fair thing when they used it on bonuses, but that was annoying. This is demoralizing to the teaching force. We hear teachers constantly say, I'm leaving because of the HISD evaluation. I can't deal with this. We have seen unprecedented teacher turnover. We lost well over 2,000 teachers last year. And we're seeing it look like it's probably going to increase this year. And, of course, what we hear from the district is it's all the ineffective teachers that have left. Well, if you have that many ineffective, you ought to fire your HR department. At any rate, uh, what I'm going to do is introduce you to Daniel Santos who is going to explain, and I'm going to get out of his way, what, but they are. <laughs> He's going to explain basically the impact. what happened and the impact to Daniel, who is an outstanding teacher. Well, first of all, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daniel Santos, and I teach at Jackson Middle School. And unfortunately, due to this broken model system, I've been pigeonholed and I've been made a caricature, an ineffective teacher simply because scores do not rise. But I'm here to share with you that I am a great teacher. I am a great teacher according to my current students who frequently remind me how I am their favorite teacher and by former students who visit me weekly from high school to tell me how I still inspire them one of whom at Austin High School has chosen to become a teacher because of me when I had her in sixth grade. I am a great teacher according to my past evaluations that were documented by multiple independent observers across multiple years and across multiple grade levels. I am a great teacher to my fellow campus <coughs> teachers who selected me as the campus teacher of the year and by future teachers interns from the University of Houston who I've mentored in my classroom in 2011 and 2012. I am a great teacher also to the parents who 24 hours ago, last night, honored me yet again for going over and beyond. And yet, according to this broken evaluation system, I am deemed ineffective. It's dispiriting, it's demoralizing, it's insulting to be told that I'm ineffective when clearly the evidence shows that I am and it doesn't mesh with my classroom performance or the time and the effort that I devote to my students. So this morning I stand united with my fellow teachers demanding an end to this broken evaluation system which punishes teachers like myself who choose to help students with the greatest needs. And before I end, I would like to express how fortunate that we are to have the support of the Houston Federation of Teachers, Gail Fallon, the American Federation of Teachers, our national president, Randy Weingarten, who continues to lead the way in denouncing value-added metrics as junk science, a sham. 
thank you for all your time. Okay, and uh, next you're going to hear from Andy Dewey. Andy teaches gifted and talented. Those glasses up, please. That's awesome. Sure. Okay. Good morning. I'm uh, Andy Dewey, and I teach uh, Advanced Placement in United States History at Carnegie Vanguard High School. I also teach two electives that I've developed uh, oh, about 10, 12 years ago, one entitled 1968 and the second one called The World Wars. These are two of the most popular um, courses at Carnegie Vanguard and helps differentiate us from from other schools. I've been doing this job for 37 years. I have never had a poor evaluation in any of the numerous evaluation systems that I have uh, I've worked under and been evaluated by many different district assessors and have always been deemed at the very least acceptable and at the very most highly, highly effective. Uh, two years ago I was one of several uh, individuals in the district who received the highest Aspire uh, bonus award uh, in the in the district last year I was near the bottom I got I got the minimum of what was granted to my school and that is my biggest complaint with EVAS it is not reliable from year to year um, I can guarantee you I didn't forget how to teach last year um, <laughs> my methodology is the same uh, I do as every teacher does. I teach a lesson and driving home my head is filled with reflection and what could I do better that day and how can I get better the, uh, the, uh, the next day. This is what every teacher does. Um, yet when I looked at my numbers last year I was in the negative range on EVAS. My students did not reach their projections. Um, I still had an effective teacher rating which is fine. I've not been one of these teachers who have been so damaged that I'm on the track to termination. Not yet. Um, but uh, the fact that we have such a roller coaster ride, especially with gifted students, shows the unreliable, unreliability and the, uh, how these scores are simply not a valid way of assessing teachers. Like Daniel, I hear from my former students all the time. At Carnegie, they go to some of the best schools, colleges in the country. Um, they come back, and I hear from many of them every year, even the ones who weren't my best students, the ones who made a one on the AP test instead of a five. And they, and they write me, and they say, you know, Mr. Dewey, I'm taking my U.S. history class in college, and the professor just gave me my reading list, and it's your reading list. Uh, and this is just going to be the, the easiest class I take. And... I always write back and say thank you and tell them that they should do the reading this time. Um, but they, they are absolutely prepared to go into college and are absolutely prepared for life. And this is what a high school teacher is supposed to do. You know, no one's ever told me I'm supposed to gra graduate from high school. Students who are capable of testing out of college. And if that's the new role, then maybe I'm not prepared for that. But my students are absolutely prepared to do anything they need to do. Yet, for some reason, their projection figures I give do not, uh, they don't necessarily meet it. I want you to understand it. I, I don't completely understand how it's done, but sometimes our kids will come to us who, who made close to perfect on the test the year before they'll miss one more question. That's negative growth. Now, you know, perfection may be a minimum standard if you're a tightrope walker, but perfection is a tough minimum standard in any other profession. If you're given a 55 question test and you get 55 correct one year and then the next year in a different subject, you get 54 correct. Is that enough to put a teacher's career on the line for? Uh, it simply does not make any sense, and this is the ceiling effect we get uh, by teaching the highly gifted and highly talented students. I always like to make the analogy that if we have a 10-step uh, staircase and you put a student on step nine and another person on step one and give them two seconds to go up as many steps as they can, 
who's going to show the most growth, most growth. Um, and that is what we're looking for. What we're looking at at Carnegie Vanguard High School with with our students, um, especially in the social studies uh, areas where the students come to us um, very very well prepared <coughs> in social studies. We see a little bit difference in math and sciences, uh, but our social studies kids are politically aware. They understand basic history. They've done their reading. They talk about it around the dinner table at home, and so they are re already very very well prepared to take us so we can take them to the next level. The tests do not measure that next level. It, they absolutely are incapable of doing it. Uh, so i am decided to allow my name to be put on this lawsuit just so we can, we can show that this doesn't only affect the, the struggling students or the marginal students, that every single teacher of every student in the school district is, is being evaluated under the same formula under the same criteria, it's truly a one-size-fits-all, and it doesn't take the uh, students into account. Thank you. Okay, the next teacher you're going to hear from is a biology teacher, Myla Van Dyne. Yes, I'm Myla Van Dyne, and I work at Davis High School. Uh, I was inspired to go into teaching due to a former career as a corrections officer. I saw the firsthand results of limited opportunities dictated by poverty and joblessness. I decided that a career in education could be rewarding. I found the perfect school since it does have a high poverty rate and it has been rewarding. Now that is until I was VAMD. VAM stands for Value Added Measure and it is sold as something called EVOS. This is the estimate made by a company in North Carolina called SAS and is based on the productivity of agriculture that has now been applied to your children. They were paid generously by Houston ISD to judge your children. Some of your children may have only been given a 4% chance of passing the STAR test. Others have been given a 99% chance. I hope that you are as uncomfortable with this notion as I am. I have seen the students' lives happen and it does not come down to a calculation. I have seen them lose their mothers and yet persevere I've seen them lose sleep. I have seen them try their hardest. But I've also seen them never believe that they can do better and instead do not try at all. The only thing SAS data has shown is that the high poverty rate correlates with less progress. There are 12 high schools in Houston ISD that show as having substantial progress in biology, whereas there are 20 schools that showed as having the least progress. The substantial progress group has a poverty rate of 59%. When you compare 59% to the district average of 80%, this group holds a financial advantage over others. The least progress group averages at 86%. They have a higher poverty rate than the district. The average poverty rate of the middle performing schools is 75%. Again, high performing is 59, middle is 75, and low is 86. The data falls with the economic lines. Therefore, there may be truth in the data, but is being abused and misused. Many teachers understand this correlation between poverty and success. I also thought it would be okay, since my colleagues and appraisers have known me to be an effective teacher. However, in response to my lower than expected progress on the scores, my appraisers' evaluations have changed to match. It seems as though they have tried to protect me with a fake growth plan that included the assistance of a person who was paid money from school funds to help our team and was never effective at actually helping our team. They do not know biology, nor were they practiced with the materials they offered us. We needed to correct them on how to use the materials that they would offer per the directions written on them. I have been released from the growth plan, however, I feel less effective than I did before since my teachings have been reduced to cramming content and creating strategies focused on how to get students to pick the right bubble. The STAR test is very limiting. It does not engage a mind to even want to solve the question at hand about things that they have never heard of and about things they will never use for the most part. Teaching based on STAR is shutting out students from being interested in a subject that is way more than what is, can be expressed on a multiple choice test. Science is a process that is based on exploring. Many topics have no absolutes. The food chain is not always linear. A sea lion will eat sharks. Before STAR, we could focus on the standards the state of Texas set forth and use more interesting contexts. Under STAR, we don't have time to explore that and instead have to stay within what will probably be tested. 
that type of teaching is not engaging for the students. And that is why I have given Houston ISD my notification that I will not be returning. I am not participating in this lawsuit for myself. Thanks to my education, I have many other career avenues to explore. I am doing this because the EVOS system targets students and teachers who have unfortunately, by the whims of Houston ISD and the state of Texas, wound up in a class that is evaluated by EVOS and in a high poverty school. And it is therefore causing teachers who have been committed to the school community to leave as they don't need to work for Houston ISD either or in that position. This is creating instability for the students who need stability the most. Instead of the focus staying on how to best care for the students, such as giving them decent food at lunch, the money is being siphoned by private companies who are benefiting by making up the story of bad students and bad teachers. Our students do have the ability to learn. They have the ability to pass the test at the desired level. The difference is that SAS and Houston ISD have made assumptions about kids that can turn on a dime, which disregards the fact that your children are much more than a calculation. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, losing teachers like Myla is a great loss to the students. And what you've heard here from the teachers is what we hear every day on the phone. It takes a lot of guts for a teacher to put their name on litigation against their district. And I want to thank them because they've stood up for every teacher in the district. Now, for the part that I'm not totally comfortable explaining, I'm going to introduce Craig Dietz. He is one of the attorneys from the firm that is filing the litigation. Thank you. The uh, primary legal basis for our challenge in court is the Constitution's Due Process Clause. Um, the Due Process Clause protects against the arbitrary taking of property. Teachers have a property interest in their employment. Due Process protects that both substantively and procedurally. Substantively, you can't take a person's property for an arbitrary reason. We contend that threatening a teacher with termination based on a low EVA score is akin to threatening a teacher with termination because it rained on the day of their evaluation. It is that arbitrary. Procedurally, when you take a person's property, you have to provide adequate procedures so that the person can defend against a wrongful taking of property. Here, because of the secrecy around this formula, how information is plugged into the formula to develop a rating, the teacher cannot adequately defend him or herself. It's like a star chamber procedure where the teacher literally has evidence lobbied against them that they can't understand and that they can't defend against. So our legal contention here is that use of this EVOS system violates both the substantive and procedural due process rights of the teachers who are subjected to it. Thank you. Okay, and obviously what we are asking for is we're asking for the courts to tell the district to stop. Uh, the next person that I want to introduce is Louis Malfaro. He is the Secretary Treasurer of AFT Texas, our state affiliate. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Gail. As Gail said, I'm Louis Malfaro with the Texas American Federation of Teachers. Uh, we are proud to stand with these distinguished educators, our members, in calling out foul on the Houston School District for the EVOS system. And we are prepared to take this fight to school districts across the state uh, who think that the best way to judge teachers is by a black box analysis of student test scores. Texas AFT is concerned about this Houston model spreading to other parts of the state. And we are acutely aware that the state of Texas right now is negotiating a waiver with the U.S. Department of Education around No Child Left Behind. And sadly, the U.S. Department of Education seems to favor 
this type of teacher evaluation based on value-added measures of student test scores. Fortunately for us, the state legislature in Texas has repeatedly refused to place value-added measures into the state's evaluation metric. And Houston right now is a rogue school district in that it is using a system that we feel is illegal, is, is, is not an accurate measure of a teacher's effectiveness, provides no meaningful feedback to a teacher regarding how to improve, and is driving students, uh, rather teachers, qualified teachers, away from the Houston School District and thereby harming students. We want to be very clear that if the state of Texas and the Education Commissioner were to decide by fiat to make an agreement with the U.S. Department of Education to promulgate an evaluation system for the whole state of Texas based on this similar flawed value added measure, that we would probably find ourselves in court with the state and we will certainly be at the legislature in the coming session standing shoulder to shoulder with the parents of the state of Texas who have already made it abundantly clear to lawmakers that they feel that their students are already overly subjected to testing. And in the last session of the legislature, we saw the first of what we hope will be many steps to roll back the overemphasis on testing and to get the focus back on teaching. Thank you. And our, our last speaker is someone that we are very thrilled to see in Houston. It's mm -hmm. our national president, Randy Weingarten, and no one has fought harder for public education for teachers and children than Randy. All throughout this country, as we're sitting here today, you have teachers in classrooms working with kids, trying to help kids build relationships with each other and with adults, trying to help kids become critical thinkers and knowledge knowers, and trying to tap into their ingenuity and their creativeness, trying to help them when they stumble and fall to rise up persist in the work that they need to do. Teachers like the teachers you just heard today, Daniel, Myla, Andy, and the other teachers that stood up courageously to be part of this lawsuit, that's who educators are. That's why we do this work. And so to be evaluated by a formula that is incomprehensible unless you have an engineering degree, to be evaluated by a formula that is so proprietary that you don't even know the basis of the evaluation, and you get it so many months afterwards that there is no path for improvement, and to be evaluated by a formula as opposed to simply asking three questions. Have I gotten the tools and conditions I need to do my job? Have I taught it and have kids learned it? And instead of having an evaluation that would actually be a meaningful measure of how we can help prepare kids for life and citizenship, for career and college, to turn teachers into an algorithm and children into a test score is wrong. And it's not as if this is the first time that anybody has said that to the Houston School District. Gail Fallon and our federation has said it pretty much every single meeting they go to. But we are taking this lawsuit because we have no other choice. Because the district has turned its back and what is really meaningful in terms of education. And the district has turned its back on people who have spent their lives helping kids, who touch kids in a way that 
opens their minds and their hearts, like Daniel talked about, who push kids to the heights that Andy has talked about, and who have left other careers to become biology teachers, a shortage area that's absolutely essential, and who are now leaving, as Myla has talked about. These teachers are the face of what is wrong with a system that is based on a number that is indecipherable, where you cannot even contest it because it's proprietary and secret. That's why we're all here today. No one disputes that there should be, should be an evaluation system. Of course there should be an evaluation system. Of course we need to evaluate teachers. Of course there should be a system about how do we have constant improvement and support. And if somebody can't do their job, they shouldn't be there. But are we really going to lose Daniel? Are we really going to lose Andy? We've already lost Myla. Is that what evaluations are supposed to be about? Or are they supposed to be about how we align our education system to helping kids prepare for life and citizenship, career, and college? That's what this lawsuit is about. And that's why we are here as the national union, as our state union, and as our local in the support of public education for our kids and in trying to make sure that teachers who only do everything in their power to help kids get treated in a way that is respectful and dignified. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, that's why you never want to follow her. You always want to go before her. <laughs> Uh, right now, I guess, what we can do is take any questions you might have of any of the people here. Well, Bill, can you explain again where this formula came from and, and how you understood You said a little bit about it at the beginning. How did it come to be? Okay, it was designed by Dr. Bill Sanders. Uh, Dr. Sanders was an agriculture major, and he came up with it initially to predict which bulls could produce the highest birth weight calves. And somehow it got twisted to which teachers could be most effective in getting kids to pass a test. Now, I mean, what I looked at was, okay, maybe it could predict the birth weight of calves, but you really only have two control factors there, and that's genetics and food. You've got a lot more factors that come into play with a child. And that's, that's where it came from. And like I said, what I think was important also is that Dr. Sanders very clearly looked us in the eye and said, using this formula on evaluation would be a total misuse. Daniel, Andy, or uh, Myla? Let me just also say before that, that's why the RAND Corporation, the yeah. Economic <coughs> Policy Institute, the National <laughs> Academy of Sciences have all concluded the VAM results shouldn't be the sole or overly predominant factor to evaluate teachers, and now the American Statistical Association has denounced it and has said that most of the variation in test scores can be attributed to factors outside of a teacher's control like poverty. So there's a lot of research basis that, um, that, that say that this formula is flawed and faulty. Sorry. And and by the way, the district will say what well, most half of their evaluation. If you look in your packets, there's a survey in there where we got a, a little over a fourth of the principals to actually fill one out for us. And in the comments, they're very clear admitting that they are pressured to lower evaluations based on what they're observing to keep them in line with the test scores. So the test score, in effect, in many cases, is 100%. To the teachers involved, what have been some of the most immediate consequences, given your track records, uh, of this ding on the evaluation? I've just had to sit down so that you can speak. Is there increased observations? or? Um, no, I, I welcome the observations. Uh, if the observations were valid, there was you know, a time that it went so far as to deny 
that I had some objectives posted, which I did have posted. And I you know, took a picture, and luckily the uh, portal that we use for our evaluation system does allow us the opportunity to do a rebuttal. I'm not sure, it, but he never looked at it, but I posted the picture and had to email and let him know, yes, it was posted. So you know, they're desperately trying to find ways to lower the evaluation, and some of them are false. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the um, feedback is, or, the, excuse me, the consequence is really lack, lack of effective feedback. Um, next October, when they close out this year's evaluation for me, they're going to give me the EVAS scores generated this year. And we're supposed to have a conference with our appraiser. Um, the conference is going to go like this. I'm going to be handed the scores. I'm going to say, these are your scores. This is your final evaluation rating. And I'm going to ask, what can I do to make those scores go up? And my evaluator is going to mumble something about differentiation in the classroom and some very, very vague things. But when the end comes, there's nothing my evaluator is going to be able to do to tell me what I need to change my instructional practices to make those numbers go up. Because my evaluator doesn't understand it any better than I do. And my evaluator just doesn't know. So we don't need to have a conference. Mm -hmm. Just hand me the numbers, give me my final evaluation. If it doesn't get me fired, I'll sign it, and I'll move on. Um, but there is la they have really built this system as one that is going to give great feedback to the teachers. And you know what? It just doesn't. It doesn't tell us what we need to do to be better because the people are evaluating us, evaluating us don't know what to tell us. And, Miley, you've already submitted your resignation. Daniel and Andy, are you guys concerned about any retaliation from the district or your administrators at the school? We are in a union, all right? We're here, okay? Um, we're not alone. Um, we're, we're, we're part of a collective group, so if they want to retaliate, they're taking on the American Federation of Teachers. And I do plan to remain. Um, I have such a connection with my students and my former students who continue to uh, visit me and my colleagues across the district who see t um, who look up to me are inspired. And to address the previous question, there has been an increase in uh, the demoralization of many of my colleagues. I regret to inform you that I understand there may be some who may not return because of this model and the attempt to push the narrative, the mythology that you are ineffective when your scores do not rise. And it's, it's as I mentioned earlier, it's insulting. And I hope that by moving forward with this, we can begin to change that narrative. And as Randy Weingarten and, and Gail Fallon pointed out, the evidence is on our side. If we continue to adopt this system, then it only proves to the world, and hopefully it doesn't, that evidence doesn't matter. Evidence matters. This cannot be replicated. There are also some teachers who have been placed on improvement plans based on the EVOS evaluation, which can eventually lead to a move to terminate. So this is very much linked to the due process concerns that Craig Dietz mentioned that are the basis of the lawsuit. Bill, is there a greater agenda at hand, you know, in implementing such an obscure formula and process here. Is, do you all suspect a greater agenda uh, that's uh, behind this? Uh, yes, <laughs> we do. Uh, in, in essence, what this does is it provides a quick fix. Rather than dealing with the complex problems that some of our children have. Now, fixing the complex social problems that result in children not completing school or not doing well in school, it's expensive. It costs the government money, costs the school district money. So let's just blame it on the teacher and everyone else will be happy. Well, that's not going to work anymore. They just can't do that. This is part of a process that we've seen nationwide yeah. of start the schools. Sorry. This is <laughs> part of a process that we've seen nationwide of starve the schools. Mm -hmm relentlessly criticize them, peddle private alternatives, mm -hmm. demonize teachers, mm -hmm. and marginalize those who fight on behalf of parents mm -hmm. and educators. Mm -hmm. And so there are choices. When half of our kids who come to our public schools are poor, we need to do things to help 
um, kids instructionally, socially, emotionally, so that we wrap services around and we take kids where they are and we help them flourish. Yeah. And instead of doing that, what's happened is that there's been a shift to just factorize schools um, try to do everything through a quantitative analysis that has become indecipherable and that then places the only responsibility for schooling on the shoulders of these incredibly caring, fantastic, wonderful people. Why are you calling this lawsuit unprecedented? I mean, there have been lawsuits in other states over value added. So what is what makes this one unprecedented on a national landscape? I'm so glad you asked that question. So <laughs> several of the lawsuits that have been filed thus far, like in Florida, like in Tennessee, they're filed on the issue about the actual evaluation system itself seems to be problematic. So for example, in Florida, there was a lawsuit that said, how can a teacher be evaluated based upon kids she does not have. Mm -hmm. So it's on the face of it, they seem to be problematic. What we've done here is to say, after it's been implemented for a while, what are we seeing as the results? And so that's why this is the first time that a lawsuit like that has been filed um, in, in um, the federal courts. And that's why we're saying that it is unprecedented. But the point is this. It's less about the unprecedented nature than what has happened in effect mm -hmm. here. Um, and that's the real issue here. You have, there is the, the dissonance between what is real for children and for teachers who have worked their hearts and souls out and have, by all other accounts, done exemplary. And then their evaluations are mm -hmm. dissonant with that. Something is wrong with that. And so that's what we've tried to do, and you know, because of the work we do, as Andy said, as a union, we were able to work together to fund this lawsuit. These, these, these statistical lawsuits are not easy to take, to contest <laughs> something that is proprietary, like we have not gotten the proprietary information. It is secret. The corporation that owns this will not give the basis upon this algorithm. So we're going to have to spend you know, funding to for discovery and things like that. But the difference is you see real people who have been affected by the by a formula that was never intended for evaluation in the first place. This is kind of a tech illegal question, but do you have to show true harm? I mean beyond not downplaying the harm, but do you have to show none of you have been fired or lost your jobs? Or... Well, remember, this is not everyone that's on the suit. Uh, it is very common that when we get our termination list in, which has jumped, I mean, prior to the use of this, we'd get maybe 20 cases that were ours. I think last year we had 125. And, you know, whether or not they resign, are fired, or are put back to work, they're still, they're damaged by it. And... You know, we, we have some that are, have been severely damaged by it in, uh, in terminations. Putting them on a growth plan damages them. They can't transfer if they're on a growth plan. Reputation. Uh, they have, their reputation is very important to a teacher, and you've just destroyed it. And, you know, I think we're going to have no trouble proving damage when we start bringing teachers in. I don't know that you need a technical legal answer above and beyond that. But there, there's all different kinds of harm besides mere termination. There have been uh, negative consequences for many of our teachers as a result of this. When you read the complaint, you'll notice that some have been put on growth plans, improvement performance plans, that sort of thing. Teachers are, are being threatened with termination. So we do think that we'll be able to demonstrate the type of harm that's necessary to bring this legal challenge. One more question. I don't know if this is for you or who wants to answer, but what is the end result? What do you hope this lawsuit accomplishes <coughs> in the end? You want to take it? Well, look, we want, we, want we want to reclaim the promise of public education to ensure that we help all kids not only dream their dreams but achieve that. 
And that means that we need teachers who are not only highly motivated, but are prepared and are supported and rigorous curriculum, including art and music and the kind of wraparound services in welcoming, safe, collaborative, great neighborhood public schools in the Houston public school system. So our goal here is to actually look at what is going wrong and change it to have an evaluation system that is about supporting and improving um, instruction, not about testing and punishing. So the first step is to actually change something that we see is not only not working, but it's fundamentally flawed for the purposes intended, and to actually change it to something that is a good evaluation system that's about improvement and support so we can help our kids succeed. And then the next step is how we long-term reclaim the promise of public education in Houston, Texas. I have to ask one thing very important. Will this dissuade prospective teaching candidates entering the field from the beginning, from entering this particular system? Actually, uh, we're already seeing that. Uh, when we talk to the deans of the colleges of education in this area, a number of them have mentioned that their students avoid HISD. Uh, you know, this isn't a secret problem. This is a problem that's come up repeatedly and gotten a lot of publicity. And it is. It's, they do an awful lot of their recruitment out of state. And, you know, way out. Of state. And way out. <laughs> California has been good to us as far as supply teachers. The problem is, they were good to us because some of their economies tanked. And now they're coming back, and the teachers are telling us, I'm going back home to teach next year. I don't want to stay in this district. Now, ultimately, this system is going to face a severe teacher shortage, and to a large extent because of that formula. And the other, what we've learned about this formula in particular, and you hear it and see it from what Daniel has said as well, is that there is a disproportionate um, um, negativity that 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 in the for teachers who teach what has been historically challenged populations, mm -hmm. whether limited English mm -hmm. proficient children mm -hmm. or children with mm -hmm. special needs mm -hmm. or children who are in high mm -hmm. poverty mm -hmm. schools, mm -hmm. they are disproportionately ranked ineffective. So think about what this means. How do we get our best teachers to work in our, with our most challenged children if they know that the formula that is evaluating them is jerry-rigged against them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.